nothing but the blood, Jesus Christ. Glad to be back with you in the study in the evening. So grateful for Norman Hare uh, teaching you this past Sunday night. Norman has done a, a wonderful job on the Saturday morning Disciple Making 101 uh, classes that we've been going through. How long did we go through that, brother? Was not, yeah, I was going to say nine months or so. Mm -hmm. Some Just some great teaching, great video uh, interlacing with the teaching, and uh, very valuable. I hope that we will find a way to use that again in some setting, some format, for our own soul's good. Plus, I want to tell you, we're, we're all... Uh, we're all family here, that the, uh, the class that's meeting on Sunday mornings for three Sundays, uh, Bethel Life, Life at Bethel, introducing prospective members and, and people who have applied for membership. Uh, Norman kind of laid that out. We, we brainstormed about it a little bit, and he took it and developed a three-session introduction that is about as uh, jam-packed and clear and meaningful as anything I've seen. We've looked through uh, membership classes, materials in the past. We've, we've had some in the past. But I tell you what, these three Sundays are so keen. Uh, and and we, have, we have now a format where it's not a, it's not a long extended thing. But in a very, very short compass of time, we can get a family, an individual, a family plugged into Bethel to see Bethel in a way that it would be impossible to see it otherwise. And if they're already attending Bible studies somewhere in, in the course of our ministry, it doesn't take them out very long. They're right back in their Bible study class. So I, I just appreciate so much the, the gifts that God has given to Norman Hare to, to have that kind of vision and see through and develop it and put it into practice. I see a lot of things. They just don't always make it on the paper. Norman's just, just the opposite of that, so I thank God for that. Well, disciple making. Let me tell you about something that's going to be coming up. Uh, the Sunday evening of the 26th, so that's two Sundays from now. We'll have a brief gathering here. And then we're going to have an opportunity to go out into our neighborhood and, and disperse by hanging on door handles and mailbox handles, uh, a flyer in, informing them about our annual uh, 4th of July fellowship picnic at Rayola Park under the pavilion like we did last year. Now, why do I tell you this? Because it is a, it is a very practical way for you to put some shoe leather to the come and see portion we've been talking about. Come and see. Come and see where we worship. Come and see uh, how we fellowship. And so I want to challenge you to make plans to be here and begin to thinking. Here's what we're going to need. We're going to need one driver and two runners for each section of streets that we apportion off. And we've got those already laid out. It will cover, like we did last year, Lord willing, the whole housing area surrounding Rayola Park on the, on the east side of, uh, of Maine. And we need all hands on deck, all boots on the ground. Uh, the good news this year is that I'll be able to walk it rather than have to drive it. That's something I couldn't even imagine doing last year. So I'm looking forward to, to a little, little sweat equity in the evening of going door to door. Do not require to engage anybody. I mean, unless, unless you come to somebody's door and you're hanging and they step out and say, what must I do to be saved? And of course, you want to, you want to engage them with that and share the gospel with them. But, but you, it's, just, it's just strictly, and we have, we have permission from the city to do this. We're all within, within the bounds of legitimacy. So let's go ahead and make plans. Begin to pray toward that time. We need, uh, we need a larger crowd than this, really, to go out and, and to do that in that 6 o'clock time. So, that, so if everybody does a little something, then, then nobody gets stuck with the lion's share of it. Uh, turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. Looking at the second installment as, as we move through Jesus. How, how did he, day by day, 
make disciples. We get a lot of help from a lot of, a lot of good people, good thinkers. When all is said and done, though, uh, the manual for evangelism, the manual for disciple-making uh, is the New Testament, uh, specifically the Gospels, though we see it developed in the, in the Acts and the letters, the Gospels. This is Jesus Christ, the original, the consummate disciple-maker. And so we're looking tonight at this passage that we've already studied through. When we went through Mark together early on in our study of Mark, we looked at this passage. It's a fascinating passage. It's, it's one of those multifaceted, diamond-like passages. And I want us to think tonight as I, as I read through this and as we kind of think through this together, that Jesus is showing his disciples here. He's giving them an example. He's modeling for them. He's teaching them as he's doing it. That daring faith or bold faith is something that he admires and God delights in in his disciples. Uh, when we were in Florida last week on, on Sunday, on the Lord's Day, Ken Pools, who is their worship pastor, introduced to the congregation a song that he had written for the occasion for Tom's 30th anniversary. Um, Tom's second daughter, Becca Sissons, had kind of helped in the arrangement of it musically, called One Passion. Uh, Let our lives and our lips declare the gospel was part of the refrain in it. Let our lives and our lips declare the gospel. And we'll be probably loading that up at some point and Josh will be teaching us that. But that's what Jesus is doing here. It's not only about what he says. It's not just that. It's about what he does. It is not only taught. Disciple making is not only taught. It is caught. Okay? So let's just, let's just read through this. You follow along as I read through Mark chapter 2. Stay with me if you would. I, I don't just ever want this to become just rudimentary or just going through the motions. This is the Word of God we're reading here. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. Uh, at a home, of course, he had no home to call his home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the Word to them. He was proclaiming the Word. He didn't have a pulpit, but he was, he was bringing forth truth to them. And they came. Who's they? These four men, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. The four friends of a paralytic. You'll remember this story. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves. And he said this out loud said to them, why do you question these things in your heart? Which is easier? To say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose immediately, picked up his bed, and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. This is what? It is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. Let's, let's ask the Lord to teach us from this and, and really search our hearts. Do we, do we exhibit bold faith? Do we exhibit daring faith? Or, or do we have a play-it-safe faith? Thank you. Be seated. Now, if you 
think about what Jesus has shown them thus far. We can sum it up with this. He has, he has demonstrated to them the emphasis of the Word, the Word of God, which for them would have been the Old Testament and then their, their oral repeating of Jesus' teachings of the Word of God in prayer. He's taught them the, the importance of that. It's not, it's not surprising or incidental or accidental even that, that when the uh, controversy arises in the early church as recorded in Acts chapter 6 when, when there's some, some uh, Hellenist widows, that is Greeks who had become Jews, uh, widows who felt like they were being cut short, shortchanged in the distribution of the food, that the apostles put their heads together and said, you know, we need to give ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the Word. This was the example of Jesus. He's taught them this early on in their, in their journey with Him. He's, he's cultivating in them uh, the con deep conviction and I would say, whatever a ministry becomes, it will never outgrow prayer and the ministry of the Word. In fact, I would say further that until a ministry becomes built on prayer and the ministry of the Word, it, it will not make significant impact in the kingdom. So Jesus has laid this as a groundwork. But you know, one, one writer observed that even if one is grounded in the Scripture, and has the practice of prayer that you still could be possibly not pleasing God. Now, how would I say that? Well, look at Hebrews chapter six, verse chapter eleven, verse six. The Hebrew writer uh, in this uh, sermon, which is the book of Hebrews, says, "Without faith, it is impossible to please Him." For whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists, that, that God is, and that He rewards those who seek Him. So you see, it's, this, this is the added portion that I want us to think about tonight. Faith, as we read the Word, study the Word, hear the Word, receive the Word, act upon the Word, not, not just going through the motions, not a legalistic adherence to the Word like the Pharisees and the scribes and the elders were so guilty of, but a, an engaging of the Word driven by faith. Faith, and not just faith in faith, faith in Jesus Christ. Because without faith, it's impossible to please him. Think about that a minute, folks. Think of, think of, you almost want to pity the Pharisees. Think of how religious and the religious zeal that they had in all of their things they did in the name of God. And yet, it could be said based on this that they did not please God. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. Whoever would draw near to God, and you, you draw near to God, by the way, in the Word, in reading the Word, and in prayer, whoever would draw near to God must believe, must believe that He is, He is God, and that He rewards those who diligently, who seek Him. And of course, prior to that, by the way, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, is a, is a definition of faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Chew on that a minute. So that's the kind of faith. The assurance of things hoped for. We, we hope. We have hope. And hope that is born out of faith gives an assurance that is not wild-eyed. It's not, it's, it's not just just like the little engine that could, I just, I just believe, I just believe, I just believe. No, it, is, it is, has an objective focus in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ in His promises to be all that He will be unto His people and for His people. It's the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. You know, Missouri is known as the show me state. Well, you got to show me. You got to. Well, that that works in some areas. 
I think it was Reagan who said about our enemies, trust, but verify. That's okay too. That's, but not in this realm, it's not. The conviction of things not seen. Do you realize, as followers of Jesus Christ, and this, this group here is made up of sincere followers of Jesus Christ, uh, that the world thinks you're crazy? They do. In fact, I fully expect if, if God lets me live long enough, and I really think this will come to my children and to their children, that at some point along the way, Christianity will be deemed a psychological disorder. To believe God leads you. To believe in a God that died and rose again and is coming back. To believe in a place after this life yeah, I fully expect it to become a psychological disorder. Parenthetically, because things that are psychological disorders are now being told to us as if they're norms. The whole gender identity issue. If you look up in old books of psychiatry, that's, that's labeled as a, as a mental disorder that needs to be helped. So one day I think we'll make the books for that. The conviction of things not seen. And so we, we have to have faith. And if you look at this, this narrative here, which we'll just go through briefly tonight, uh, what happens? Well, he's got a, got a courtyard full of people. They spilled over into the house. They spilled over back to the entrance so that anyone who, who came late couldn't get in. He couldn't muscle his way through, through the entrance into the house because it was filled from stem to stern, from the front of it to the back of it, spilled over into the courtyard where there was a, a crowd there. And he's preaching. And you look at who's there. The scribes are there. Now, I don't, I don't judge anybody's heart, but do you really believe the scribes were there to learn from him. I think they were sitting there early on in the ministry to, to hear, to listen and see what he had to say to report back to their... So you have the scribes. You have the disciples. They're, at this point in the, in the ministry, they're, they're in awe and wonder and gratitude at getting to, getting to hang with this rabbi. There are needy people there. And you can imagine that all of them were hanging on every word Jesus said. And then suddenly, the message is interrupted by some kind of noise. They didn't tear back that roof quietly. We've had a whole neighborhood built up behind us since we moved in. There's nothing quiet about work on a roof. If it's going in, it's loud. If you're pulling something out, it's loud. I think I told you when we preached through this in the morning, and when I was at the First Baptist Church of Clinton, we had a problem with bats. We, had a, we literally had a belfry. You came into one, one entrance and there was a tall tower and there was a bell up in it and you could actually take the rope and ring the bell. But there were bats that lived up there. And it smelled horrible when you would come through that entrance. So most people came through the other entrance. It was more, more for show than anything else. We tried our best to get rid of the bats. We, we, brought, a, we brought a bat expert out and, to try to capture them. And it was just it was bizarre. Well... These bats would move around. And there was one at the, in the facility in Clinton, right over the pulpit. Of course, the whole, the whole roof structure went like this to a pitch. But over the pulpit, there was this beautiful arch. And we noticed at one point that a bat had taken residence there. I mean, hung there. Now, I wasn't around there 24 7, so I don't know if he hung there all the time, but all the time that we were in there, he was hanging right there, right above me. So, one evening we were preaching I was preaching on the attributes of God and talking about how God is he's, he's omnipresent he, he dwells in the heavens and his majesty and as I was preaching some little something dust I'm not sure what fell down on the pulpit I was hoping it was dust well I knew that the bat was stirring at some level. And so I, I didn't want to just look up and 
draw everybody else's eyes there, though by that time they were pretty much headed there. <clears throat> and on the tape, if you listen to this particular sermon that night on the, on the confession, I'm talking about the grandeur of God, the attributes of God, and the bat takes flight, just drops, and, and there is a, I've never heard it before or since, a collective congregational gasp. Okay. Well, then I said, this is what's kind of strange. In the middle of talking about God reigning in the heavens and ruling in the heavens, I said to the congregation, without context, is he still up there? It's kind of strange. I don't know. I hope that tape's not being circulated today. That's my point. My point is that it took very little to distract me. I mean, this, this bat just stirring a little bit. Little old bat distracted me and everybody there. Can you imagine... What was going on as Jesus is teaching with, with power and with passion and this roof begins to be torn up? I would submit to you they didn't, they didn't catch it all. It wasn't a clean tear. Some of this is falling down. It's, they're in close proximity to Jesus because that's the whole point is these, these four friends of this paralytic man have heard. Think about that. Do, do people we know, have they heard from us things about Jesus that would make them move, remove roofs to get access to him. These guys had. And they dropped this man down. The scripture says it in front of Jesus. Well, for a moment Jesus stops teaching on what he's teaching on, whatever that was. And no doubt all eyes turn to him to see how is he going to react to this. These people have, in, in a traditional sense, have just interrupted the service. Think about it. Just put it think about it. If we're, we're worshiping here one Sunday and I'm in the midst of preaching and, and four people walk in with a, with a gurney and they come down to the front and they lay this fellow on the Lord's Supper table. That's, some, that's disruptive in any arena. On here. We're waiting to see how Jesus is going to respond. Remember now, he's teaching. Everything he's doing is teaching. He could have easily said, what do you want me to do? He asked that in other places in the scriptures when, when someone with a great infirmity is put before him. What do you want me to do? But he's teaching. So he doesn't ask any questions. He makes a pronouncement. Son, your sins are forgiven. Well, the scripture says he did this in response to seeing, and this is always this has always fascinated me since I since I really began to understand this passage. After seeing the faith of his friends, I would submit to you that the normative means of having your faith forgiven, having your sins forgiven, is to express faith in Christ and know that you have forgiveness. Now maybe this man was doing this. Maybe, maybe this cripple looked up at Jesus and that was happening. But that's not the point of the passage that we're being taught here. He saw the faith of his friends and so I, it, it constrains me to ask, I asked this back when we studied through this, does he see in me such faith to act on behalf of those in great need. Family members who are wayward. Sons and daughters who may be obedient but are not saved. Seem indifferent to the gospel. Parents older than us, closer to the end than us. That's, because Jesus is going to be teaching about what pleases God and what pleases God is, is daring faith, bold faith. And that's what we're going to see in these men. They ignored conventionalities. They ignored tradition. They, they broke with decorum. They trampled protocol. They were so in earnest to see their, the need of their friend met. But it's interesting, Jesus meets his deeper need. 
your sins are forgiven. Well, of course, this causes a stir. We read, we read it a while ago. Who is this man? Thinks he can forgive sins? Only God, God alone forgives sins. Well, see, it's interesting, because what they said was true. It's just that they said it, like we looked this morning, they said it in a doubting way. They said it doubting that Jesus had the authority to forgive sin. And so Jesus engages them. Your sins are forgiven, he says. So Jesus says, why do you, this is verse uh, 8, why do you question these things in your hearts? Well, he's basically challenging them and chiding them for doubting. Which is easier? To say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven. Now he's still speaking to the crowd, and specifically speaking to the doubting scribes. Or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Mark tells us editorially, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. Now this is astounding to the people. In fact, when we taught this earlier in Mark's Gospel, I told you that to understand the miracles of Jesus, because you have to know that He did not, He didn't heal everybody He passed by. There were multitudes of sick people. He didn't feed everybody that was hungry. But every time he did act in a miraculous way, it was to present this window. And it's through this, which is easier, but that you may know. The question is, how do we know that the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins? Because he accompanied his teaching with miraculous power. That leads me to ask a question of myself and of you. Do people see in our lives the miraculous power of Jesus at work in us? And I'm not talking about the name it, claim it, health and wealth types. I'm talking about our being a walking miracle. Do people see that in our lives? So that they would be constrained when told, when shared the gospel, <clears throat> that this tangible evidence constrains me to believe that Jesus is who He said He was. And He did what He said He would do. He is who my friend tells me He is. He did live perfectly. He did die substitutionarily. He did was buried in a borrowed tomb. He did rise three days later. He has ascended on high. And He is coming back. Let our lives and our lips declare the gospel. A great refrain and a great a great new song that's been written called One Passion. He's teaching his disciples. God meets this bold faith with his delight. In fact, it's interesting, the text tells us here the man arose, verse 12, immediately picked up his bed. It had to be a sight. This man had probably, we don't know how long he'd been a paralytic, but for however long he'd been a paralytic, he had never left his bed. His bed was his home. His bed was his world. His bed is what sustained him. His bed is what he was carried on by his four friends. And in this encounter with Jesus, he stands up, he picks up his bed, he carries his bed. It's, it's, now, it's now a piece of furniture for him. He's going to take it back home. He'll put it over in the corner wherever when he needs to go to sleep. So he picks up his bed and went out before them all. This is another thing. We were told beforehand that you, there wasn't any room. And you know what's happening. This man's stood up, got his bed, he's walking, and the crowds are parting like, like the Red Sea probably as he walks out of the place on his own power. It took four to bring him in. Four men, eight legs. It took two legs, his own, for him to leave. And then we're told here, 
so that they were all amazed. And the word amazed is, 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 a, is an interesting term here. It means ecstatic. They were ecstatic. Think about yourself. When you've seen God perform a miracle of healing or deliverance or salvation, no one yawns at that, do they? Pe people who know Christ don't yawn at that. We, we get ecstatic. It fires us up. And that's the response they had. They were ecstatic and they glorified God saying, we never saw anything like this. And here's where we get back. See, faith, we said earlier, faith is the, uh, is the, is the confidence uh, in that which we've, we've asked, the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And that's the kind of faith that we must demonstrate to provoke from people as they observe our lives, as they come and see and observe our lives together as they come and follow and they see us as followers of Christ and they understand that's who we follow, that's why we live, that they're constrained to glorify God. Jesus taught this in the Sermon on the Mount, remember, in Matthew's Gospel. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. The emphasis there is not on works, <laughs> It's own good. The word there is beautiful, lovely, uh, appealing, pleasing, that they may see the pleasant power of God in your life, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Now it's true that an unconverted person cannot glorify God as he ought to be glorified, but I'll tell you what, Nebuchadnezzar, after he was, was finished grazing and growing hair and, and talons like a bird, when he came up out of that little experience, he gave glory to God. There is, there is a glorifying God that, that is the response to a, to a demonstration of the great power of God. And this is what Jesus is teaching them here. But faith often flies in the face of logic and the facts as we see them. Look at this man. Why would these men waste their time, their energy, vandalize someone's home, interrupt a gathering of a rabbi whom they are convinced has the power to heal, I mean, run the risk of offending him for crying out loud? Why would they do that? Because faith often flies in the face of logic. And the facts, as we see them, in fact, faith, remember, is the conviction of things not seen. We have, uh, we have challenges in our lives. Are we going to operate strictly on the basis of what we see and sadly, some people operate on the basis of what they feel. That's, I had a professor one time that said, trusting in your feelings in difficult times is like taking an anchor in a, on a boat in a stormy sea and casting the anchor on the bow of the boat. It doesn't anchor you at all. It's just still tossed, tossed about. Are we going to act in the, only in the face of what we see or are we going to act by faith in, in the in the promises of God and in our, our knowledge of the capacity of God. When we pray, we talk about this on Wednesday night prayer meeting, when we pray, we are praying to Him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above anything that we know how to ask or think according to His power at work in us. You see, Faith takes risks. And faith that pleases God sees dynamic results. There was an inscription on a building that I, I came across this in, a, in, a, in something I was reading.
He's commending a type of man. A man who sees the invisible, hears the inaudible, believes the incredible, and thinks the unthinkable. This is a person who is growing in his or her love for Christ, confidence in God. And whose life bears witness in such a way that people are often constrained to say, tell me, why is it that you hope? And brothers and sisters, darkness is coming to this country quickly. What has played itself out in Orlando, and I'm not trying to sensationalize this, I'm just simply observing this through the lenses of Scripture, what has played itself out in Orlando is going to happen again and again and again. The largest mass murder in our history. The greatest tragedy, if you can even use, if that word even fits, since 9-11. We cannot be the people who doubt. We cannot be the people who fear what's coming. We cannot people, be the people who tremble and who want to hunker down and hide. We must, we, we must get out in front of this. We must go not with a political critique of what our president will or will not say, not showing favoritism to one candidate or another in terms of how they've responded. We must go with the good news and transformed lives. Like our visitor said this morning, this book will change your life. An encounter with Jesus Christ that begins with an encounter in the Scripture is life-changing. And Jesus is teaching these men while He's anchoring them in, in the, the significance of, of the Word, knowing the Word, proclaiming the Word, and prayer, crying out to God. In other words, what, what God basically told Ezekiel in that, in that precipice overlooking the valley of the dry bones when, when God's Spirit took him there and said, Son of man, can these bones live? I love the response there. The prophet said, Lord, you know. He didn't answer him and say, Well, you know, we've, we've been working on that in our church and we, we have a plan that we think can put... No. Lord, you know. And that pleased the Spirit of God because he said, Son of man, prophesy to the bones. Preach to them. Son of man, call for the wind. Pray. The Word and the Spirit. The Word and prayer. And of course, you know the story. As he preached to the bones to live and called upon the wind, the Spirit, to come, the bones came to life. Well, folks, our mission is the same. We live around dry bones every day. And you hear, just listen, just learn to listen to people. And oh, you hear the dryness. You hear the distastefulness of life. You hear the you hear the angst. And we have an opportunity with bold and daring faith to believe that God can make these bones live. Let me ask you if you closed it. Can you picture anybody in your mind tonight that you say, this person, this person is beyond saving. This person is beyond hope. If you do, I want to challenge you to start praying for that person every day. A couple of things are going to happen. God's going to burden you for that person. But also, the Lord may take bold and daring faith and do the amazing and, and rescue that person. And here then is the argument. <clears throat> if, if the Lord will save that one, who, who do I know that is outside His reach? And the answer is you don't know anybody outside His reach. 
So he's teaching them this here, I believe, when he, when he has them sit in with him in the courtyard, hear him preach, and then when the interruption comes, he does the most amazing thing. He speaks forgiveness of sins. And how should people begin to embrace the idea that they are sinners and that Jesus forgives sin? It's as they see dynamic faith in us. They see us living boldly, joyfully, confidently. We don't know, and I, 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 I repent. I've been guilty of this. I'm wringing my hands about, about the two choices we have for president. You know, I've said strychnine or arsenic. You know, but you know something? Our king is on the throne. Be good citizens and vote. Vote your conscience. But our king is on the throne. And he will not be upstaged by anybody. He'll not allow that to happen. And so he would look down upon us and be pleased. And I close with this. We are pleasing unto the Lord. Without faith it's impossible to please him. May he look upon us and see faith. But not only, not only just that, that faith is surviving in our lives, but that faith is thriving. That we are cultivating and developing and encouraging one another and provoking one another and spurring one another on to bold and daring faith. Stepping out. I believe if you and I had been at the Red Sea, if you go back and read the text, the waters of the sea were lapping the shore. Moses stepped. The waters parted. Scholars will differ about this. But I don't think the waters parted before Moses stepped. I think Moses stepped into a sea with bold faith. And God parted the waters. I, I despise these movies that, that show a, a Moses on the shore wringing his hands, frustrated, wondering, what are we going to do? No. Bold faith. Daring faith. That's what God is looking for. He, he's pleased with that. He delights in that. He blesses that. He answers that. So let's be such disciples. Let's talk about it for a few minutes. Let's pray and then discuss this. Dear Heavenly Father, help us.